I'm joined today uh, on our latest Survive and Thrive webinar from Sussex Innovation in partnership with Gatwick Diamond Business uh, by three panel members. Uh, so I'll give a very brief introduction now, they'll introduce themselves shortly uh, when we each go round in turn and they give, have, have, have an opportunity to talk about their business and how they've innovated during the pandemic. I'm joined today by Will Golder, who's the director at Race Nation. I'm joined by Mustafa Qureshi, who's the COO of Adaptive Diagnostics, and Chris Giddens, who's the founder and CEO of Unicodo and Four Local. So what I'm going to do is ask each of our panel to basically talk about the three timeframes of the past, so where they've come from to be where they are now, a bit about themselves and the history and their business, uh, the present, so what's happened during um, this time of uh, the pandemic and the impact that COVID has had upon their business. But most interestingly, I think for all of us, um, what's the future? So how have they innovated? How have they uh, pivoted perhaps their business model and their any new value propositions that have come out in, in response to the pandemic and what's next for their business? Um, so we've got about time for about 15 minutes for each of our panel to speak. Um, and then we'll take questions. So you've got the chat function um, to ask questions. I'll be moderating those questions and asking them on behalf of you, our audience. Thank you so much for taking the time to dial in and join us on today's webinar. Um, I'll ask those questions on your behalf um, once each of our panel have had a chance to speak. So without further ado, Will, if I could ask you to unmute. Um, and Will, if you could give us your story in terms of yeah, the past, present and sure. future of Race Nation, please. Sure. No problem. So uh, yeah, thanks, Simon. Um, welcome everybody. Thanks again for, for attending, and and hopefully I can give you a bit of an insight not only on on Race Nation, uh, what we've done, but also like like Simon said, a bit of an insight into what some of the decisions from a business point of view, from a technology point of view, we've had to make going forwards. Uh, so I guess to to start with, just to explain to everybody here who may or may not be aware of everything that Race Nation does, we are a sports tech company based in the, the Brighton office in Pharma of Sussex Innovation. We, um, as, as a company, we work in the mass participation sports arena. So we provide all the online entry and fundraising for mass participation events. So you can imagine, and we'll get onto it a bit later on, that from, a, from an industry perspective, we, we have and, and we're hit quite quickly, but quite hard. Um, and, and so therefore our, our journey through all of this has, uh, has been an interesting one. To, just to, to fill you in on the picture of Race Nation, like I said, online entry and fundraising for mass participation events with also an event day app. So before Race Nation existed, um, you would be able to sign up to take part in a, a marathon or a triathlon, half marathon online through, through different platforms, but then you would be asked to go somewhere else to set up a fundraising page. What Race Nation did is provide uh, or still does provide an, an integrated solution so that as people sign up to events they have the ability to donate to charity there and then but they also get automatically created fundraising pages and it's so the seamless link between signing up to events and fundraising themselves the event day app uh, came, came along by by really sticking to it to our ethos of why we were born we, we were born from from the event and charity side of the fence from two founders that were working for a charity, putting on an event, and really had the problem, as, as I said before, where they were asking people to sign up on one platform and, and go somewhere else to fundraise, and people just weren't necessarily making that full journey. So, so they built Race Nation as an idea and a concept on the basis of providing to the masses and to every event or any event of any size, what originally was only really available in technology to the big events that could afford to pay for it. And that, as we've progressed through, came, came to our event day up too, where we, we now see that a lot of the big city marathons can license or build an event day app that allows you to have push notifications, track entrance as they run, um, be able to scan in and, and check in at different locations and, and really provide an event day experience. But that, again, only very recently came to the market, but only for the big events. So what we did is uh, last year actually we started to build out our event day app that would allow us to, to again provide to any event of any size a solution that was originally only available to the masses um, and that's really why why we've done well we've we've grown over time we were founded in 2014 
um, and, and we've grown from looking after a few events to now working with over 2,000 events across the UK. Um, we've helped raise millions of pounds for charity through our integrated fundraising platform. Um, and, and our fundraising platform is called Sports Giving. So we have Race Nation as the online technology and we have Sports Giving as our, as our integrated technology. The Event Day app has, has really, um, or was really showing traction in helping us continue that growth. Um, and as I said, now working with over 2,000 events across the UK, we are on a good path. Um, as, as a business, in, in January 2020, we had a record month. So we had um, best month from entries, best month of fundraising, best month of, of revenues and everything we were doing. Before um, COVID started to, to hit um, certain aspects of the world, uh, and we started to see whispers of it around the world, and then very quickly, it hit the UK and, and the UK government imposed restrictions which affected us all and we all had to move quite quickly into that. Uh, I guess a bit of background on myself, um, I, like I said I've been actually, Race Nation was founded in 2014 um, and actually I joined the team in 2015 when there was there was three of them at that point, so uh, the two founders um, and, and an extra developer um, and so I joined in 2015 after a, a career in sport um, and that, that finished in, in late 2014 and then, like I said, moved, luckily found Race Nation and, and moved into that. My first role or original role was on the business development front. So um, I was brought in and, and tasked with helping them grow their business uh, from, from the few events they were working with, taking the idea and the concept and growing it to the masses, which, um, as you can see, we are on a, a good journey in doing. And, and there's still a long way to go and we, we all have uh, aspirations for it to continue but um, you know we, we're on a good path and and my my role through the company progressed since 2015 um, through 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 the business development channels into becoming a director a couple of years ago uh, and then actually taking over as exec director uh, 18 months or so ago taking a seat on the board and, and uh, being tasked with what was slightly daunting at the time, but the day to day running of the business and, and, and a seat on the board. So my, I guess my, my journey into from sport into business was, was quite rapid. And also my, um, my growth through race nation was also the same. Um, but we invariably always keep ourselves quite, quite well grounded in, in making decisions based on our original ethos of we were built and founded from the events and charity side of the fence to, to provide a solution that makes everybody's life easier, saves everybody time, everybody money, um, hence the, uh, the, the technology that we have. Um, now, I guess the, the present moving, moving into to where we are now, as I said, we are on a great path with, with record months in January um, before restrictions imposed um, by, by the world in, in, in a way, but certainly by the UK government where the majority of our events sit um, and what we had to do very quickly was was analyze where we're at um, after in January as you can imagine we were speaking with our investors um, and, and looking at the further investment and further rounds by saying you know this is all great what do we do um, you know what, what we were talking valuations extended um, extended investment rounds and, and that side um, where quite quickly that those decisions um, and conversations didn't stop, but they, they took a, a very quick uh, turn for having to, to look at the, the detail in, in a bit more around the valuations and where we go. Now, as a company, we're very lucky to have a loyal set of, of investors um, that, that believe so much in the product and obviously saw everything that we were doing, that they, they continue to believe in that. And, and um, I, I firmly believe that as, as we come through this, those that, that innovate, those that support those, uh, everyone around them will, will come through this for the better. And, and so not only did I have to speak with our investors and, and sort out um, to, to make sure that we, we had this continued investment raise, which, which we did, we managed to open and close around um, during this process um, to, to give us long-term roadmap. Um, that was one of the first things I had to do. Uh, but then as, as a company, um, taking the business side out of it, we then had to look at what what we what our client base needs. You know, there, there was a lot of people around us that that needed support. Our, our event organisers, our charities that we all work with, 
were, were all experiencing or finding themselves in a situation that no one had found themselves in before. No one planned for a pandemic. And, and to put that into perspective, uh, an event cancellation policy that, that previously could have included pandemic cover would have, in, would, would have added 0.1 of a percent onto your premium. Um, that's all it was prior to this um, because nobody expected it. Nobody really was, was frightened about it. So, so the risk was obviously right down there. Now you obviously clearly can't get insured uh, for, for pandemic cover. But at the time, prior to this, you can see by only being a 0.1 addition to your premium, it, it, was, it was negligible whether it was, it was ever thought it would actually happen. So we had, to, we had all these organizers that found themselves in a position of uh, what do we do now? Uh, and so us as a company, we decided um, that the best thing we can do right now is support uh, and, and support everyone around us. So, so we, we didn't furlough any staff. We retained all our staff to really support those that we had. Um, and, and I guess on one hand, it's lucky that, that our investors backed that uh, and, and allowed that to continue. Um, but th there was so much goodwill within the, com within the company, but also in the country going on around us, we felt that it, you know, at the very least for, for retentions uh, and also customer support was, was to say, hey, look, you know, we're here to, to help and support you. So that was one of the first decisions we took was, was in and around um, supporting our existing clients and, and making sure that we help them every step of the way. Yes, it cost us money, but the, the goodwill, the, the new business that has come from that has actually been, been quite, um, quite good to see. You, you know, we've actually had new business come along from, from competitors who may have not been able um, to, to, to be as, as proactive as we've been. Um, we've actually been, we've picked up some new business off that. But also the, the goodwill that's come from our existing clients has been has been really great to see and be, us being able to support them through it. So that, that was another decision we had to take really was was really supporting the industry and supporting what we've got um, and, and that side. We then had to, I, I guess, move to the innovation and the technology and, and, and very quickly from the event world, we, we've all probably seen now the virtual events that are, are spinning up everywhere with the event industry having to find ways to be able to look after their current entrance um, with london marathons moving to october the whole whole event industry decided that october was a great time um, but also the virtual world and so virtual events spun up everywhere so again another another decision we took was to support that uh, and we we very quickly sat down with with our developers in-house and and built out some some tools and features for for uh, virtual events and um, again we were, we were lucky to be able to do that and move quite quickly with it the the basis of our event day app that we launched in december um, really were, was the foundations for this for us to be able to adapt that and improve it um, and, and really build out these features and, and very soon we'll be releasing even more enhanced features that will allow virtual events again to not have to go, not have to sign up on one platform, fundraise somewhere else, and then also now what is go to Strava, Garmin, Fitbit, and do all your runs, put the time in on, on a result service. Again, the, the ability to have it all in one place will, will be, uh, be released very soon. So again, we just had to really look at the market, listen to, to our current clients, and, and work out what they wanted and needed. Um, so from there, as, as I said, we, we, we went through business decisions from investors. We went through business decisions to support our industry and everything we've got. And then we also looked at our technology and, and had to innovate to, to move with the times. And, and we weren't necessarily um, ever looking to do that. But the fact is that we, we analyzed what was there and, and saw it was needed. We've also done uh, a few a few industry deals to to continue to support the market, and and that's really what what our main benefit is going to be here to 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 everything we're doing is we really are in a position to be able to support those that need it, and so we've also been developing some some partnerships with with other providers and third party providers, not in com competition to us, but um, things like event calendars that we can now do deals with between us to support the whole industry that that will allow events to be put on this calendar so that anyone looking for events will be able to find it so again we we, we innovated our technology but we then did some 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 deals with with partners um, and some partnership deals that we would again probably never done before um, but actually the 
the the number one reason for doing this was in, in support of the industry. So um, that that's really where where we've gone through. Um, opportunities continue to present themselves by being here, and and the goodwill element from supporting our existing clients and charities again has been uh, has been massive and, and and a great lesson really for for the future for us in in, in this. Um, what does the future hold? It's, it's difficult to tell. Um, like I said, the, the event industry was probably one of one of the first to go based on, you know, thousands of people could not be in, in the same place at the same time. And the likelihood of that coming back in, in the coming weeks is probably quite small, but we're, we're quietly optimistic about, about the future. You know, that there, there are um, plans afoot to be able to do it. Um, and and what, what we had to do as a business is, is make sure that we are positioned ready to support all those that need it. So make sure that when events can come back, all our clients and, and new business is ready to push go. So it's not about waiting for that to, for that time to come. It was about, look, let's get it set up, ready to go now. Uh, and, and then when that time comes, it's very quick to, to push the button and, and, and move on. Um, and as I said, that's, that's done us quite well through it. So, so the future in the coming weeks, short term, might might still be of of um, no, not much ticket sales and, and that side, but we're we're optimistic that as we move into August September events, small events will come back. Um, and to be honest, at that point, who knows on the big city marathons? Um, it really depends on on quite a lot that's out of our hands. So we we controlled everything that was was in our control. Um, we we had to look at costs. We had to look at um, everything that we could. Like I said. Very, thankfully, investors gave us a, a, a really long runway now for years to come. So we, we have um, no worry there on, on that sense. Uh, revenues will come back and very soon we'll get ourselves into a position that we were in in January 2020, which, um, you know, on, on one hand, you could look at it and say, wow, you know, how bad luck. We, we, we had absolute records from the history of Race Nation coming through and, and things were, were the best they've ever been. Um, but the good thing is they were there. We've got the goodwill of our customers by still being here. We've got investment that will allow us to continue. But also we've now got new opportunities, new ventures, new avenues, new partnerships that this period has allowed us to do. Um, and I guess to, to finish off on that, the, what one of the difficulties of, of doing all of this and, and the hardest thing is that actually in, in, in coming into this, we're, we're all busy in our businesses and, and prior to COVID, we were all busy trying to break records and trying to do business, but we, we actually found ourselves in, in a technology point of view with a bit of a backlog. Um, and so actually coming into this period of, of lockdown and reduced contact on one hand from, from clients and a little bit more time on developer hands, we actually used the initial period to catch up. So reduce some of our backlog, some of our technology and some of our bug fixing that we needed to do. Uh, we used that time to catch up, but, in, in, in theory, it put us, if, if that took us four weeks to catch up and polish what needed polishing, we couldn't build for four weeks the innovations that we wanted to do. So again, it was a bit of a lesson for us to say that, you know, we, we shouldn't um, allow ourselves to, to build up or, or produce backlogs uh, too much. Because again, when things happen and when you need to pivot, when you need to innovate, um, it then also just all back, backs up as it comes through. So. Uh, as much as we've got through it, and again, you know, credit to the whole team as, as to, to what we've done. We, we moved everybody home quite early uh, and everybody is, we haven't really seen a reduced capacity in, in outputs from any staff. So we've got all staff at home and it, it's, been, it's been really great to see. Uh, and like I said, credit to our whole team, I guess, in, in that. Um, but a lesson from, from us as a board and management is that we we had so much we were doing and and the the, the technology world is is 100 miles an hour um but in in having a small backlog it meant that our innovations and moving quickly and innovating in a time of need necessity or or urgency we've made that one step harder by by having that small part so if there was any lesson from that it would be that we would keep keep a a harder harder touch point on that to be honest does that make sense? I, Simon, I hope that kind of answers a lot of your questions and, and back. Well, you've done spectacularly well in terms of giving that story of past, present and future. Thank you. Um, I was just scribbling some notes as you were talking. Yeah, sure. 
um, one of the key themes for me that came out was this kind of just being open to opportunity um, and having that kind of growth mindset despite being in a pandemic, despite facing mm. unprecedented challenges, still looking, listening to the market, looking at the market, understanding where the needs were and really developing solutions and, and, uh, and opportunities from that came out of that. Um, so that, that was fascinating. Thank you for sharing your story. Um, really, really interesting to hear. Um, so, Will, thanks so much. Uh, Mustafa, I'm going to turn to you next um, to give your story, please, in terms of, you, yours is pretty much more condensed in terms of a story because you're still in the very early stages, but I'm sure you'll get, get to that point in terms of telling the story of uh, adaptive diagnostics and what's going on with you guys. But you've got a really interesting new business model coming out of this. So I'll let you, uh, t I'll let you tell that story now. Okay. So, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Mustafa, or Must for short, whichever you prefer. I'm pretty easy. Um, as always, Simon, it's good to see you. And Will, yeah, just before I go into a bit about myself, I have to say the things that I really um, heard from you was how you, your company, you know, you stuck to your values. Um, the event industry is obviously one of, you said, one of the first to go, so I can imagine it was super difficult. But it seems like you got the trust from the investors and you guys can adapt and I'm sure you guys will succeed. So all the best in that. And um, yeah, so then I guess a bit about myself. Um, I'm actually Sussex alumnus and I studied there for a biological sciences between 2016 and 2018 and I didn't do my degree in two years I actually transferred from Brighton at the end of my first year so that's why I only spent two years there but after that I went to do a master's in medical biotechnology and business at the University of Warwick and it was while I was studying on my master's course that I become aware of the Sussex Innovation Startup Competition of course run by Simon so I entered on it with an initial idea to create biodegradable bioplastics, which is a bit of a mouthful that, but basically we just wanted to create plastics from waste. So every Wednesday, you can imagine I sort of journeyed down the M40, which is not a bad road. I don't mind the M40, it's better than the M1. Um, around the M25, it's a terrible road, no matter what time of day. And then, yeah, um, down the M23, sort of to Brighton, uh, which is always a nice straight road. And, a bit of a long drive but I stuck some tunes on and it always used to seem to go a bit faster. I won't tell you what radio stations I listen to though. I think you might be a bit surprised in my music taste. Um, but yeah, to be honest, um, I think with the initial bioplastics idea anyway, we run into a bit of a, or I run into a bit of a patent minefield. I'm sure Simon will remember just me having a few frantic conversations. I was frantic. He's Simon, Simon's always a calming voice. He's actually my mentor at the time. So yeah, we had a few conversations about where are we going? And um, yeah, it seemed like it was a bit of a dead end at the time. So anyway, um, back, up to, back up to Warwick that evening. Um, made it into a 9 a.m. the next day, which is rare. I barely made it into any 9 a.m.s uh, throughout my whole time at uni. <laughs> Um, but yeah, made it, it was a medical diagnostic module and I sat next to a guy called Fergus and that was just by uh, coincidence because I was running a bit late anyway. Now Fergus was explaining to a group of people about an idea he had for a poster assignment set by our module leader at the time, Bruce Savage. And his idea, um, you know, it was to create a medical device for a specific disease. And, um, yeah, I mean, the idea was fantastic. So that night, I sort of watched that Fergus and um, asked him if he wanted to sort of team up with me and maybe take his idea forward for the Sussex Innovation. And long story short, you know, we, we, we proceeded with Fergus's idea. Um, we got awarded the Social Impact Prize from Sussex, and that award really gave us momentum to co find a startup called Adaptive Diagnostics. Now, Adaptive Diagnostics is a molecular medical diagnostics company developing and also commercializing. Uh, user-friendly, rapid, low cost, and really accurate point of care devices for infectious diseases. So what are infectious diseases? And you know, they're really a class of disease caused by microorganisms such as bacteria or viruses that can be passed from one person to another. And the most obvious example you, know, you could give at this point is of course coronavirus. Coronavirus is an infectious disease. So a bit about our company and you know, our mission really is to sort of Increase the global access to disease testing um, for universally adoptable medical devices and to help build a future where the diagnostic process is decentralized. And what I mean by um, a decentralized diagnostic process is that, you know, if you can imagine 
um, you're in a hospital, you're, or the nurse needs to take a patient sample and they're in one wing of the building and that she has to take that sample and then send it to a central lab, maybe in a completely different uh, area of the building, maybe in the heart of the hospital. And then they have to perform tests on that sample. The people performing the tests are obviously really highly skilled scientists using expensive machinery. So they, that, that sample goes in a pile of other samples and they perform the tests and that gets sent back. And you can imagine, you know, the guys mentioned a couple of things about that process there. You know, it takes a while. You need highly skilled people to do it. And it might cost a lot for the reagents for the machine as well as the actual machines that used to perform the tests. So this is really where point of care devices come in. And the point of care device literally does sort of implies what is the name says. And they bring the point of care to the patient, i.e. a nurse can perform the test in, in front of the patients in his room and get a result um, there and then. Hence the benefits I mentioned, you know, low cost, user friendly, rapid and accurate. So that's sort of, yeah, a bit about our business and a bit about what we're doing. You know, Simon said we're early stage and we are. So that's, that's, that's sort of what the direction that we want to head to. So, you know, back to the narrative, me and Fergus, then uh, we were still master students at the time. So as you can imagine, it's sort of hard to juggle this startup and our masters, but our course director was super understanding. And, you know, he afforded us the time to do both, uh, which was good. And uh, we're grateful for that. But it turned out Fergus's, for another coincidence, Fergus's third year dissertation tutor was the head of a research group that were researching the type of bio, biosensor that we needed to add for our device. And, you know, just like a light sensor detects light and a heat sensor detects heat, a biosensor is just something that detects other types of biological matter. So that just might be a protein in your blood or a virus like COVID, for example. So Fergus reached out to his dissertation tutor, you know, so he explained um, our idea to him, see if he had any space in his lab. And he did. It's so a great, you know, um, Fergus moved into his lab and started doing the research. And this is where the grant from Sussex really helped, you know, contribute to this initial phase of R&D. And it really helped get the ball, the ball rolling. And at, at this point, everything's going well. You know, we got the grant money. We found somewhere to do our research. And when Fergus is cracking on with it, uh, it's going well. And this is sort of where coronavirus, COVID-19, you know, was reaching its peak. And like other lab facilities we were using, like many other places in the country, had to close down. So research was put on hold as a result. And, you know, at this point, we started to lose a bit of that momentum that we'd been building up. And for me, sort of keeping that ball, like we're an early stage company, so keeping that ball rolling, keeping some momentum going is so, so critical. And um, do you remember the lecturer that I mentioned, you, who I said was heading the medical diagnostics module, Bruce Savage? Well, we approached Bruce while we was preparing for our Sussex Innovation pitch. And Bruce, you know, he helps also mentor us, give us a few insights, practical pointers, uh, some bit of advice. And Bruce, um, he specializes in biotechnology startups and has helped build many successful companies over the years. He's currently CEO of a company called GFC Diagnostics. Now, GFC Diagnostics have a couple point of care devices on the market, but their main one is um, a technology called Isoscreen. So Isoscreen is basically a point of care device that helps uh, monitor treatment adherence for patients with tuberculosis. Anyway, one morning, Bruce, Bruce informed us of a grant offered by Innovate UK. Um, and this was called the Business-Led Innovation in Response to the Global Disruption Grant. So a bit about the grant, you know, it was a, it was a, it was a um, £20 million support package offered by Innovate UK, aiming to support UK businesses developing innovations to help meet the emerging or increasing needs of society or industry before and during, um, before and, f f during and following sorry, the COVID-19 pandemic. Anyway, so later that day, Fergus Bruce and myself, we sort of had a Skype call. I know what you're thinking, Skype, right? Well, we tried, we tried Zoom, we tried Teams, but we had a bit of a technical difficulties. I'm looking at Fergus now, he's giving me a little smile. So we, anyway, we knocked our heads together on a Skype call and um, we decided that we were going to submit an idea um, for a 
um, point of care test, the testing kit for coronavirus. Um, so we just sort of the next few days or weeks or whatever, we were just sort of really getting our getting our heads into this applica uh, grant application. And you know the competition it received eight thousand six hundred uh, individual applicants with eight hundred companies um, getting a grant, which is around ten percent success rate, of which we were one of the lucky few. Now there's, there's there's loads out there on coronavirus testing, and it's it's been in the headlines for all sorts of reasons, all sorts of contentious reasons, and you know rightly so. It's it's an important topic, and um, the, the pandemic has sort of really bring brought to light how the UK diagnostics industry maybe is not as strong as it should be. So I'll continue just by outlining some of the benefits of our proposed technology versus what's already on the market. And the first one. It needs to be highly accurate. You know, there was a, there was a few. Um, the government recently bought millions of test kits from China. I think antibody test kits, and they all failed. When they got to the UK regulatory checks, they failed because they, they wasn't accurate enough. So, of course, accuracy is good. You need to make sure you're not getting any um, false results where someone's maybe positive but the test has come back negative. So that's uh, really important. Uh, it needs to be rapid and um, you know, if, if you want to test for someone with coronavirus and it's done in a lab, these, these are really, really accurate, um, but they might take a while to perform. Um, and there are a few point of care devices on the market that take maybe less time. Um, but you know, there's always a trade off between sort of speed and accuracy. Some, um, sometimes yeah, you need to be user friendly. You know, there's no point in creating a device that you need really specialist person to, be able to use to be able to operate that sort of defeats its purpose ideally what you want is a simple set of instructions or an explanatory video where the user can look at it and they'll be able to use the device really easy um, low cost you know it's just, that's, that's an obvious one always good to save the NHS and some of the healthcare budget where possible and so one for the future which is not really for this project that we got the funding for but we want to be able, we will be able to modify our technology to be able to test or differentiate between what virus you have. So, you, could you imagine, you know, for all the students, if they go back to uni in September, you want to know if you've got freshers' flu or like coronavirus, right? You need to be able to tell the difference. That's important. So, if someone got flu or if they got COVID 19, because some of the symptoms, um, they can, they're overlapping. So, that's, that's an important point. And a good benchmark for all point of care devices um, is the World Health Organization published an assured criteria. And this just outlines uh, some key things that they, they expect to see in a point of care device. And many tests fail on a few fronts, uh, but for anyone that's interested, it's well worth checking out. That's the WHO's assured criteria. Um, yeah, so I already mentioned Bruce's company, GFC Diagnostics, and the test, a bit about the test they've done. But they actually supply that test to uh, the NHS, so they're an essential business, and therefore their labs and their, their offices have remained open during the COVID, the, uh, the, during the pandemic. So Bruce sort of reached out, uh, said to invited us in to work, sort of perform our research in his labs. It's very kind of him, and yes, I mean, so at the moment now, uh, that's where I am. I'm in, I'm in his labs in Banbury. Um, North Oxfordshire, maybe Northamptonshire. Um, at the moment, you know, we're setting up the project, ordering all our lab supplies. Fergus and I have a long old trip up to Manchester on Thursday yeah, to pick up some lab equipment, um, which we're looking forward to. And yeah, that's, that's the present, you know, that's really where we're at now. So before I talk about a bit about future direction, maybe just pause and sort of summarize our pivot, just because I think that's really what we, um, here in this webinar for and so you know first we won the social impact prize from the Sussex Innovation Centre and we began research we used this to begin research at the University of Warwick on a biosensor for our medical device COVID-19 pandemic happened and it caused all the labs to close so accordingly our research was put on pause we applied for we then applied for and got uh, granted funding by Innovate UK to develop a COVID-19 diagnostic test and move from our labs in Warwick to now in GFC Diagnostic Labs in Banbury. And you know, so the, the main thing about uh, our pivot, and it's something that I can't really talk into too much detail, 
about, but it's the actual technology that you know that forms the basis of the device. So, um, hats off to Fergus here. He's our product champion, but he um, came up with a really awesome idea, and so we changed the molecular basis of the medical device and the technology uh, used in it. And yeah, that, I mean, them five, four or five points are really the essence of our pivot. So um, a, bit of, a bit about future plans. Really, this, this Innovate UK is a six month project. So, you know, we're dedicated to developing this coronavirus test. Um, really looking forward to make some good progress on this. Um, hopefully we want to put down some IP, some intellectual property rights in a month or two. Safeguard our invention is crit absolutely critical for commercializing. Um, once the technology is then developed um, and we get it working in our labs, the next stage in the diagnostics development pathway is validating it using real patient samples. You know, it's one thing to do it in a lab, it's then it's another completely different thing to do it on re real life samples. So, what we're looking to do here is forge partnerships with universities, medical schools, and NHS trusts to help facilitate this research. And finally, the technology we're developing. Um, it's a platform. We're not developing a test for coronavirus. Well, we are, but we're developing a platform that can be applied to loads of different diseases. So we need to go out and raise more finance now to help build us, help build some internal infrastructure. So um, and maybe hire someone, uh, one or two people, so we can help sort of branch out our portfolio of diseases that we're able to detect. And yeah, I mean that's it from me. If anyone has any questions on anything, please hit me up at the end can't really discuss much on the technology even though I'd absolutely love to but anything on the anything to do with our startup I'd be more than happy to do so so back to you Simon. Thanks so much for that Murph. that was fantastic uh, really interesting journey and story uh, that you're, you've been on so far and so much to come from you guys but so congratulations again from my side of securing that Innovate UK money in a very Thank competitive you. in a very competitive environment. I think I can see yep. the coronavirus actual diagram just behind you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, a, yeah. that's a nice one there. Okay, good stuff. Thank you so much, Mustafa. Uh, without any no further worries. ado, though, I want to turn to Chris Giddens, uh, the CEO and founder of Unicodo and Four Local, to give his story of the past, present, and future uh, and the innovation through the pandemic. So, Chris, over to you. Thank you, Simon. Hello, everyone. Um, as Simon said, Chris, uh, Chris Giddens, founder and um, co founder and CEO of Unicodo, a, a venture that myself and Julius uh, Samoy, um, co founder, started back in 2014 when we saw some challenges around, um, I should start with really Unicodo is a promotion engine um, that's for e-commerce platforms to use to add more advanced capabilities and abilities and more sophistication to their digital marketing promotions and campaigns using voucher codes. So everyone uses a voucher code online to go and get a discount when they on, on their online shopping. Well, we, for our clients, we allow our, our, our clients to do that in a much more advanced, sophisticated and controlled way. Our clients are people like, uh, include TUI, Expedia, Travelodge, BT, EE, um, and, and, and large number of fashion retailers as well. Um, and we're used by their sort of digital marketing teams to step forward their, their in-house capabilities and augment those um, in, in-house e-commerce platforms with Unicodo's promotion engine to to give them those tools and we started the business in 2014 because um, I was I was at a conference seeing a lot of um, listening to a lot of advertisers and, and e-commerce brands talking about the problems that they faced with promotional codes and promotional codes leaking online so putting them on one marketing channel and in an email to a to a group of customers and those codes leaking and ending up into other marketing channels and generally disrupting marketing campaign activity. Um, so um, we, so I was thinking about that and, and, and thought, you know, how could that be solved? And, and, and we came up with a, a very simple way of being able to switch on uh, to any e-commerce website or store, the ability to do unique single use coupon codes. And that's personalized codes for every single recipient in a marketing campaign. So every single customer gets their own unique voucher code that they can go and use and redeem. And when they redeem it and get their discount or get their promotion, the, the voucher code is turned off so then no one else can use it. And that's where the control comes from. So at the heart of it, it's really simple. Uh, a platform that generates unique single use codes. Um, and a lot of e-commerce platforms don't have that capability. So we very simply add, add that capability. And in the years since we've been 
building upon that core capability and adding lots of more advanced tools and sophistication and um, you know, the ability to do different types of promotions, mystery discounts and time-based discounts and revenue-based discounts where the level of discount actually changes based on time passing by or amount of spend or or just it's a mystery. You don't know what discount you're going to get until you enter the code into the basket. So all of those are just sophisticated techniques that an advertiser can use to make their marketing more effective. Um, and yeah, going since 2014 and um, have been on a, a great path ever since and been, been a business that's been growing every single year um, based out of Croydon and Sussex Innovation in Croydon. I've been there for you know four years now and have been growing the business there from just the, the, the two or three founders at the time to a team of 10 based out of Croydon. And um, at the start of the year, we had massive plans and it was an exciting opportunity. We were um, just about to hire, uh, well, we'd, we'd hired three new starters to join the team. Um, we had plans to, to add people into our sales function in the business. And, um, and then I went away on holiday uh, back, in, back in March and everything started uh, crumbling around us um, when, when the kind of restrictions are starting to be put in place. Um, and obviously our clients are, uh, are we're quite heavily in the travel space. So TUI, Travelodge, Expedia and, and a few others too. And, and as you can imagine, they were starting to see some, some that had some massive concerns and um, seeing their business dramatically change overnight. Um, and seeing business fade away, people not booking holidays, people not booking hotels, and just and people phoning up and cancelling their holidays and trying to get out of, of the, the bookings that they made in 2020. And and I guess that, that period in March, just before the bigger restrictions were put in place, every single day I was getting a phone call or two from a client saying, um, we're going to have to pause activity. We're going to have to pause campaigns. Um, we're going to have to stop any marketing. And that was having an effect to us where they're saying, look, we don't want to pay you for a few months. We kind of want to delay paying your invoices. We you know we'd like to almost cancel contracts um, for the foreseeable future. And so it was, it was tough times every single day when we were having these conversations and, and just seeing sort of a large proportion of a, a, a large, amount of revenue sort of potentially fade away but also we were having great conversations with a whole load of new business that we were about to win and um and also quite a lot of that was in the travel space and and they've all delayed their activity until the foreseeable future really and we might get some of that back at the end of the year and win that business but it's looking likely in 2020. Um, so as the world was you know kind of changing in and going in a completely different direction and, and going into lockdown um, Julius and I started looking at the, the business and um, kind of trying to decide, you know, what changes we needed to make. You know, we had to look at the relationships we have had with clients um, and go, what's the most appropriate action for each one that was having a challenge right now? What's the appropriate action? And that might be, you know, letting them have a pause on their contract for a period of time, or, you know, it might be appropriate to actually chase them and make sure they do pay us those fees, or, um, you know, just just giving a level of flexibility so that you know, being in this together with our clients and being there for them and allowing us to come through the other side with them still a client. And so we had to sort of look at all of our clients that were having challenges and um, and decide what measures we were going to put in place to, to help them through. Um, or, you know, actually to make some tough decisions and go, you, not might, you might not make it through. Actually, we do need to prioritise making sure that our, our invoices are paid so that we can keep our team in place and and um, and and not and not sort of make anyone redundant or or heavily furlough the, the team, which we've not needed to do. Um, so yeah, so we've looked at the business. Obviously, we had a bit of look at looked at the, the costs of the business and 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 some of the areas that we could cut. But I didn't really want to lose any of the team. You know, there's one person that it made sense to furlough, but everyone else we needed to keep them up and running because we knew we had clients to support and promotions to, to help with for those that might not be suffering right right now. Um, so, you know, we kept the team in place. Obviously, we had to go to remote working and everyone was spread out around the world. And, you know, um, people are, are, are literally all around the world now. 
and we're we're coping fine and and working really really well um, in a distributed way, um, and and so also we sort of looked at actually as long once we got the core business sort of a little bit settled and we looked at to make sure that we had the revenue potentially coming in, in the future and clients coming back to us in the future we actually looked at our technology and how we could do something with that technology now to maybe help businesses that are maybe struggling right now and so the heart of as i said at the heart of the technology is a promotions engine uh, the ability to create unique single use coupon codes that can be used to apply a discount or an offer or a promotion or provide access and we thought well how can we take that to businesses that have just had to shut their doors and close down their business for a period of time and we came up with uh, a new venture and that was called local support vouchers at the time but is now called forlocal.uk and for local is a marketplace of small and independent businesses who are able to list their promotions and deals and offers and sell vouchers directly to their customers and consumers via the For Local UK platform. And, um, and we kind of put, we, we kind of rapidly sort of put the idea together and got a, a team around, a team of engineers around um, our, our technology, our APIs essentially, to build out a, a, more, a more consumer uh, proposition of Unicodo uh, to let businesses sign up, get businesses on board and help them and give them the marketing tools that they could use to, to help get customers to buy vouchers that can be used when, when their business reopens again, their hairdresser reopens again or their restaurant, but also as a place, a marketplace where they can list their promotions and offers and incentives um, that, that will be there for customers to use when they open again. And hopefully the vouchers give some short-term cash flow boost. Um, but actually we see quite a lot of the businesses say, we don't want that money now, but we do want the, we want that money eventually. So they've been selling vouchers to customers and that money's being held back for when they reopen again. Um, and it's, it's actually been a really, really interesting uh, venture to try and get started. It's been taking Unicodo, which is typically a, a B2B proposition. We sell to big businesses, big e-commerce companies and trying to sell to small businesses has been incredibly hard and difficult to do. Um, it's a completely different approach. It also, a lot of those businesses, when we went live with the platform in April, were just reeling in shock at just what the, what was going on right now and just couldn't fathom what to do. They were more focused on um, other things than trying to get their business uh, re, you know, selling, selling vouchers or um, trading again. You know, I, th I think they all felt that they were so far away and were just almost just trying to work out how they, how they keep money in their bank accounts and um so actually it was a tough sell and um, so we've we actually sort of helped with uh, so we got some help from um pr agency and um i put a call out to um via linkedin and, and through a job site actually for a furloughed marketing director to come and help us and we managed to get someone to come and help us to to take the the product and the go to market take the product to market and to put a go to market strategy around for local but what we've um, so what we have now um, is is for local.uk. That platform is there. It's got um, over 600 businesses on board um, listed within the platform, and um, a large number of those, or a good number of those, are are there listed and able to sell sell vouchers directly to the consumers. There's a pledge element where customers can come along and search for businesses and pledge their support for those businesses and and then we recruit them and get them on board so that they um, can transact and buy a voucher or get to get promotions um, and the platform's there and we're looking at now um, how we actually make some uh, give this platform some longevity and and looking at how we take it take it forward further and looking at partners that can um, take the platform forward so they're big the save the high street.org is a big organization about driving driving the high street forward and so we're looking at organizations like that that we can partner with to provide our technology in a more SaaS software as a service b2b business like way and give them the tools and technology to roll out the four local platform to their audiences and actually so we've kind of transitioned from a b2b business unicodo uh, the technology we're providing to big e-commerce retailers into this 
for local, which is a marketplace and trying to tackle providing the technology to uh, small businesses directly to actually now the long, long, the long term plan, which is now providing the technology back in the B2B style to organizations who can introduce it out to um, out to businesses through their their distribution reach and methods that they have. Um, so yeah, so we, we took a bit of a pivot, but it's not changed the direction of our core business Unicodo, but we've, we've got that new platform in place that actually becomes the almost the entry point into Unicodo as a B2B platform. Yeah, we've got the high end big e-commerce platform um, clients, but actually we never had anyone at the, that low end. And now we've got dog grooming parlors, we've got a hairdresser, we've got a few pubs, restaurants, and cafes that are now customers of Unicodo at that really um, small independent business end that gives us a, a really good range and allowed us to, to look at the opportunities to drive the platform forward and innovate. And I think, I think we've done that pretty well. We, we did take a, we did have an attempt at getting some of that funding from the Innovate UK uh, scheme that Mustafa was talking about, but we, we weren't lucky like um, him and his business actually. Um, we didn't get that, but um, so we bootstrapped for local out of our own funds and luckily we were in a, in a position to do that because of the, the, the core business Unicodo being successful and um, able to have some cash reserves to be able to do that. Um, but there, yeah, so the, the, the future is, is a, a multi-layered platform to Unicodo and, um, and now we've got a client base at that small and independent range, uh, independent end of the market, but also right through to big e-commerce like TUI and Expedia worldwide. And it's been a really fun place to, over the last few months doing this all from home and um, employing all sorts of uh, suppliers and, and people to join the team to, to make that journey possible. Um, and, and we're in a, a really exciting place now to take the business forward with all of this uh, new technology in place. Um, yeah, I mean, that's probably, probably about it for me, Simon. Perfect. Thank you, Chris. Um, thanks, thanks to each of you for your stories. Really interesting, really compelling, really uh, diverse and different in terms of um, your own businesses and the propositions and how things have grown and changed during this time. Um, in the next about five minutes until we're wrapping up, so if any of the, the, the uh, participants want to ask a question either in the Q&A or in the chat, then please feel free to do so. Um, I have had a question come in from Sandra Murphy from Sussex Business Doctors. Sandra, thank you. Um, here's a question for you, Chris. Uh, the question from Sandra is, so why would retailers use for local rather than selling vouchers directly to their client base? Uh, she, by the way, she really loves the idea and she'd like to talk to a couple of her clients about it, but why, why use um, for local rather than selling directly their own vouchers? Um, I think, so, the for local is a marketplace it's not just a place for selling vouchers it's a place for listing promotions and deals that customers can engage with within uh, with as well um so it doesn't need to be just a, a 20 pound voucher that's sold it could be a, a a two cups of coffee for five pound voucher that could be sold it could be um a deal you know 10 percent off in store on a saturday something that doesn't have a value that you buy now it's a um, it's a it's a, a more traditional promotion, and so the the platform supports lots of different types of deals and vouchers, and they're all powered by Unicode behind the scenes. Um, and um, Unicode's platform makes it very very simple to uh, inter to issue a voucher code via the the four local marketplace to the consumer for a particular promotion, and then we've made the tech really really simple to redeem those codes directly in the shop, the store, the cafe. The restaurant all done by the web and a mobile phone so you don't need more than a mobile phone and the and the internet to be able to redeem a voucher and know what to apply in the till system no big complicated point of sale integration very very simple but the the advanced part the the reason for using my the marketplace of four local is to to get advantage of the different types of promotions that can be listed in that marketplace in addition to a simple gift voucher Cool. Makes loads of sense, Chris. Thank you. Uh, just so you know, you've just uh, you've got as a result of being on this webinar, you've got a new customer, Heather Barry, the coffee impresario, um, has signed up for Four Local. So thanks for that, Heather. Um, Fantastic. Yeah, happy days. So a question for each of you. So I'll go around and invite you to each to answer in turn. A question coming in from Mo Kangelau from Kiss the Fish. Um, Mo asks, how are you all feeling? Um, are you feeling optimistic about the future for your business? So Will, uh, how are you feeling about the future? 
genuinely quite excited. Um, initially, when this was all happening and when it was all starting, it was a case of um, we are on such a good path. What do we do? But actually, but just the the initial ability to stop reflect see these new opportunities now is actually quite exciting because as, as i said we've we've managed to do deals now that we would never have had the opportunity to do before the the ability to pause has given us the ability to think um and actually think outside the box and, and these new opportunities now presenting themselves um actually means that we now not only have um have some some significant traction to come back to but we also have two or three new avenues um, of quite significant business opportunity that that weren't or wouldn't have presented themselves before um, immediately they may have always come about and we, we obviously hope they would have done but it was the the initial ability the ability to pause and, and think allowed us to think outside the box uh, and and now these new ventures are are again what i'd say 100 miles an hour straight ahead um i said before simon we're spinning plates and and we're now spinning plates of of what is multiple um opportunities and, and new companies coming up in in sisters to race nation in a way great thanks well mercy if i could turn to you how are you feeling about the future yeah i'm feeling optimistic about the future i think i was the optimistic person by nature but um i think with any you know with, if you're doing biotech r d you, you need you need money and you need somewhere to do it i think it's a very expensive process just you know, buying the, all the reagents in something that me and Fergus is sort of realizing now, buying the lab equipment you need, buying the reagents you need, uh, the, the premise, the cost of the premises and the labs. So, you know, that that um, big funding from Innovate UK uh, was a, you know, new lease of life and it helped sort of project our company in a sim very similar, you know, we're still developing medical devices for infectious diseases, but, um, yeah, it just gave us, like I said, momentum to keep going. And the really interesting, the really th the thing that really interests me about the technology and what we're doing at the minute is, like I sort of, sort of mentioned it briefly at the end, is, is that we're developing a platform, and the platform can be, you know, spread into loads of different diseases. And um, event like when if, if hopefully everything goes right with this project, which will allow us to sort of kick on and raise more money. And then, you know, branch, like I said, branch out into other diseases. So I'm looking forward to the future. I'm optimistic. Great stuff, Miss. And Chris, finally? Um, I think when, when things get a little bit more difficult um, in the economy, so a recession, actually, more and more consumers are really searching around for the best price and the best deal and the best promotion when they're buying stuff online. So in 2008, back in um, the last kind of big recession, I saw that from the inside of the e-commerce industry then that, it was a huge period of growth for e-commerce um, and I, I can see it being the same and I think technologies like Unicodo are kind of best place for actually help advertisers get back to business again and certainly the travel space who have got um, potentially a huge amount of capacity that they need to fill in late 2020 and into 2021 as well that, that they're going to need to be strategic and tactical in, in how they promote those those holidays and and when they um, when capacity is high, then uh, the need to run promotions is pretty key. So I think there's a there's a lot of opportunity to us for developing existing clients, but winning new clients as well. Great, thanks, Chris, and thanks again each of you. Um, we could all spend a lot of time chewing the fat, um, but I'm conscious that each of you, as founders, entrepreneurs, directors, exec directors of your businesses, that you really need to crack on uh, with the rest of your day. So thank you very much, each of you, for your time in joining us on today's uh, Sussex Innovation Survive and Thrive well. webinar. Um, it's been really interesting to hear your stories, really compelling, really, like I say, diverse, and uh, such interesting innovations coming forward into the business. It's uh, a real pleasure, actually, to, uh, for, from our perspective at the Innovation Centre to work alongside such um, interesting businesses and great people as well. So uh, we wish you every success as you move forwards. Um, thank you to each and every person who's taken the time out of their day to join us on the webinar today um, and uh, to listen to those stories uh, from Will, from Mus, and Chris. Um, wishing each and every one of you an excellent afternoon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Cheers. Cheers. See you later. Bye.